Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with ABS Mastersmith Jay Nielsen and Shelly Jack of Gypsy Soul Knives. Jay is known for his impeccably forged classic American outdoor fixed blade knives, especially Bowie's. His reputation and mastery of the form got him his founding role as a judge on the most famous knife making reality competition TV show, uh, Histories Forged in Fire. Shelly, I just met and got a chance to check out her work at the Texas Custom Knife Show just this uh, earlier this past month. Uh, you know, I've been talking quite a bit about that show recently, and I had a chance to meet them both and bring them on the show. After uh, first talking with Jay way back on episode 34, I finally got a chance to meet him there. So that was really cool. I also got a chance to watch them both do a canister Damascus in real time, which was quite exciting. I'm looking forward to catching up with them, but first be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell and download the show so you can listen to it on your favorite podcast app. And if you want to help support the show, you can do so by going over to Patreon. Quickest way to do that is to go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Do you use terms like handle the blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp, or tank like? Then you are a dork and a knife junkie. Jay and Shelly, welcome to the show. It's great to see you here. Hello. Hey, how's it going? It's going great, going great. Uh, I want to uh, first say uh, it was really nice to meet you uh, both in person uh, at the Texas Custom Knife Show. Uh, I met you, Jay, on this show just uh, voice to voice a few years back. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then, Shelly, I've been following you on Instagram, so it was cool to meet you both uh, in the flesh uh, this past uh, month at Texas Custom Knife Show. Uh, it was a pretty cool uh, uh, occasion down there. Oh, it was a lot of fun. Um, it, it's funny. Uh, uh, well, apparently we got a lot of comments from that uh, video of the tomahawk to the head. Yeah, the that, was a, thing. that was a good hit. Um, but the, <laughs> the biggest thing I've been getting grief for lately is from this one here, because apparently everybody got nailed on Instagram. Uh, but they left my slow motion of tearing the brains out of a ballistics dummy. Didn't didn't have any problem with that, you know. So yeah, that, was kind of weird, that so. whole shadow ban thing that they did, um, yeah. I got I got flagged, and I've appealed it a couple of times, and they still haven't um, taken it off. But yeah, he he has that graphic video slow mo of <laughs> chopping the it's, dummy's head. It's pretty cool. and like he didn't he didn't get flagged for any of his stuff, but. Yeah, oh, well. yeah, as we speak at, at the end of uh, 2023, uh, Instagram went on went on this very strange shadow banning of the most, uh, you know, uh, most non-threatening knife channels out there. Uh, and uh, somehow uh, this footage of UJ just tearing apart this ballistics dummy, uh, complete with the red blood, not the green blood. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Condom and, flinging around the head and everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Graphic graphic and nasty uh i'll actually uh, that was pretty cool uh to see how those dummies are made uh they uh the ballistics uh, dummies guys were at that knife show too it was cool to oh they 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 do they do a fantastic job um I, i'll tell you a secret little story if you want yeah um right before we did our demo we were we were both yeah i'm gonna tell that story we were both tired we were both exhausted i mean we we worked harder on that at, at that show than most um, and it, she was getting a little crabby right before we did our demo. And, uh, she I was had, ready she, for the day and, to be over And she, with. she had her first little, you know, knife, fixed blade knife she ever made. And there was the ballistics dummies that were sitting in a flatbed behind the stage that Doug had already torn through. And, you know, her and I had had conversations about these ballistic dummies from the you know, forge and fire and everything else and, and doing different events and whatnot. And she was looking a little crabby. I said, hey, honey, come over here. I said, you know, we talked about how real this feels. I said, why don't you take that little knife in your back pocket and stab this guy <laughs> a few times? And and she, uh, and she, wow, it's a lot harder than I thought. And then she starts really going at it. And I was like, 
okay. And like after like six or seven stabs, she has a big smile on her face. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm gonna be sharing a hotel with this woman. Uh, okay, but she's smiling at the end. So ballistic dummies stress, make people happy. Just stress really. <laughs> yeah, it seems like uh, it would be appropriate to have one in in many offices throughout the nation. I know my office could uh, benefit from a fresh ballistics dummy every week, uh, no <laughs> doubt. Um, yeah, actually, that would be that would be really cool because I'm always trying to um, fashion, you know, think of ways to fashion, you know, there's the meat man, uh, go mm. to the woods, get some uh, bamboo, buy a whole bunch of pork. But I mean, Coconuts. you know, yeah, yeah. Coconuts, you can you can bash those. Well, OK, so a big part of um, that show, the Texas Custom Knife Show, was uh, kind of this. Uh, oh, there was a lot of presentation with you and Doug. Uh, in front of the audience, a lot of people very curious, myself uh, also, about how the show is put together and and all that kind of thing. Uh, you and Doug had a really uh, fun rapport. Uh, you guys do this a lot, uh, do a lot of traveling together and end up at shows like this, or is it because you've done 10 seasons of the show, you guys know each other so well? I am stuck in a trailer next to Doug. <laughs> Doug gets bored very easy. He's He's... I love Doug to death, and if he's listening, he's going to know I'm telling the truth. Uh, he's one of those, he's, he's like one of those children you need to occupy. <laughs> uh, there's been multiple uh, Instagram posts that Doug has done of stupid things with me in a closet, laying down in one of the blue dummy forms, standing in front of a tank, uh, all kinds of stuff. And it's one of those things like, okay, let's just do it because it's quicker to just do it and get over with and him, instead of having him bug me all day. <laughs> and I have no problem saying that because Doug knows it's absolutely true. He would <laughs> does that and agree with me right now. Well, yeah, uh, he was saying you, you'd you be um, content uh, in your trailer with a couple of horror movies between mm -hmm. uh, between shoots and stuff like that. Uh, uh, yeah, Shelley, I, I sometimes that... I try to watch the movies and just, I might not even have something on the screen, but if Doug's talking, I just focus on the, I just <laughs> oh, yeah. try to pretend that, yeah. Well, that's good. And I don't see you, you don't see me. You're kind of living it, you know? <laughs> uh, Shelly, do you, do you share this same love of horror? And uh, do you get any, any knife, like, inspiration from it? I know Doug, uh, I, I mean, I'm sorry, I know Jay does. Um, no, actually, it's kind of funny. That's one thing we don't have in common. Um, I don't watch a lot of TV or movies, period. Um, and But I have sat down and watched a couple of them. Horror movies have never been my thing. Um, but I've learned to appreciate some of in, them. In the theater is different. Yeah, and in the theater it's different. But um, also, you know, there's a whole other genre of just really bad tacky horror movies and those are kind of entertaining to watch just because they're ridiculous um but no i i don't share his enthusiasm for them <laughs> i haven't gotten her to watch killer clowns from outer space yet no. oh god no. <laughs> yeah you know what i i go for the i i only really like the stuff that that actually scares me uh yeah. you know a demonic possession scares me so uh, I will, I will, I will move on from there. But, but I, actually, Shelly, I want to know how you got into knives. We're gonna, uh, I, I want to mm -hmm. refresh her on Jay in a minute. But, but tell me how you got into it. And um, uh, when I was looking at your work at your table, um, I was pretty surprised at how, um, you know, kind of new you are to it because your your work seems much more accomplished. How'd you get into oh. it? Well, thank you very much. Um, well, that's an interesting story. Um, we've told it a few times. Um, I was I'm going to go bake a cake. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a travel. I was a travel nurse, and I had an assignment in Pennsylvania up here, and um, I was taking a break in between. You have contracts that are 13 weeks, so um, I was taking a break in between that, and I was flying home from. Uh, up here in Pennsylvania, back to Texas. And I got a free upgrade. And on that upgrade in first class, I sat next to a gentleman that was on his way to the Atlanta Blade Show. And um, that, was that was him. I had never had no idea what custom knife making was, didn't understand the concept, had never seen Forged in Fire. Um, say hi to Ray. <laughs> 
And um, uh, and he didn't even really, we didn't even really talk about that. He said something about being on Forged and Fire, and I just kind of blew it off. Like, oh, yeah, I, I think I'd watched an episode. I had never seen the show before. Didn't know what he was talking about. And um, right, off, right off the bat, he's lying. <laughs> And um, the circumstances were very unique and it just turned into um, I was coming back for another assignment. So we exchanged information on that flight, went on some dates and started talking. Um, and uh, one later on, after a month or so, he invited me to his house and I wanted to see, I had done a lot more research about making knives and stuff and I wanted to see his shop. I wanted to see um, what it was about. And um, that turned into me um, forging out my very first knife. And it's the one that I still carry. That one's in here too. Isn't it? Isn't it's gotta be around here somewhere. Well, uh, Shelly, are you, were you already a creative person going into this or did you discover something uh, when you first started heating and, Pounding. No, I, I had been, in fact, the shop, the knife shop that is being built in Texas now was originally supposed to be a pottery shed. I like uh -huh. doing pottery and throwing pottery. So I was going to get a kiln and a wheel and all that kind of stuff. And uh, now it's not. <laughs> now <laughs> it's a knife shop, probably about halfway finished, I guess. We're, we're getting, we're pretty yeah, close. Yeah, we're well, getting there. You, you got a kiln of sorts and you'll be able to use clay, you know. <laughs> Uh, when you're tempering right. your blades, so it's not right. we can make we can fire pots that we can destroy doing strength tests. Yeah, oh, yes. yeah, of course. Yeah, that. Uh, so, uh, um, well, uh, this begs the question: is, is there any similarity between working with clay and working with steel? I've done a little bit of both, uh, but never a hot steel. I've only done a little bit of um, stock reduction just uh, for fun, um, but. But you get a sense of sculptural, you know, um, uh, process with that. Uh, any any similarities? Yeah, actually. Yeah, um, that's interesting that you bring that up because when I first uh, became serious about this and uh, wanted to learn, and he's like, "Okay, I'm going to teach you." One of the things that he said to me that made the biggest difference is um, that hot steel moves just like sculpting clay. So, you know, if you squeeze it and at this point, it's going to squish out this way. And if you, you know, put, you know, squish it flat, it's going to move a certain way. If you do it, roll it, it's going to move a different way. You're going to get different thicknesses and stuff like that. And um, that was the quickest and easiest way that I got to be able to, um, when I'm working with, uh, the hammer and anvil, you know, how am I going to hit it? And that's the, that's what I do is I imagine how it would move in clay form and it translates pretty, uh, easily into, you know, the hammer and the anvil moving it and shaping it that way. Uh, and the, the, and the press too. Well, yeah. And the press too. And the, uh, one of the bases I used that for was during, you know, when we were doing forge and fire, um, they would ask me sometimes, okay, well, we got a three inch ball bearing. Um, how big of a sword can we make? And I'd look at them and I was like, I have, I have no idea. I can't do, I can barely add multiplication in my head or anything like that. I don't do numbers. You know, I swing a hammer for a living on an anvil. You can't expect too much from me, but take that same three inch ball and make it into clay and just squeeze it out with your hands and you can figure out exactly how thick you can make it, you know, how long, what you can get out of it. Just do it in clay. Just assume that you're going to lose, you know, say, you know, five to 8% from burn off. Um, but I mean, you can get a pretty good gauge on that. Um, but for some reason I had to tell them every season, this same thing over and over. <laughs> but, well, that, yeah. that's actually, uh, that's really useful. I, and it, it stands to reason, but I never would have thought of that. Uh, but yeah, uh, uh, also just assuming that you're going to lose some um, as you're as you're making it. Um, I'm, so, I'm very big on simple solutions. Well, that yeah, and and something that you can see. It's not just like mm -hmm. doing numbers in your head or or drawing out figures. Uh, Jay, you we were talking about horror before. I know that you are you live uh, in 
Western Pennsylvania, right? Uh, uh, northeastern, or, actually. Northeastern. Okay. Uh, I drive all the way through Pennsylvania. I grew up in Ohio and I live outside DC. So I, I go across PA a couple times a year and I love it. Uh, I love Pennsylvania and uh, it is full of forest. Uh, so uh, I was reading on your website how you said you spent a lot of time kind of isolating uh, yourself there, uh, learning mm -hmm. your craft. Um, what was that like? I've never been the most social person to begin with. Um, and I had this very, very bad habit of when I was trying to have a regular job a long time ago. Um, I I'm a little too honest for my bosses. They didn't like that. So I'd never held a job for very long. So I did basically every mundane job you could think of um, until I figured out I could actually make, <laughs> make a couple of bucks here and there making knives um that was back when i was selling you know hunters for like 35 45 dollars a piece this was back before there was an internet or anything like that you know the only thing you saw about knives was the, you know the blade magazine and out here it would come every six weeks instead of every month so uh but well to, to me there's a real like uh romantic notion of kind of squirreling yourself away, especially in nature and focusing on your craft. What was the, what was the solitude, uh, to your getting better? I, I the broke soli up some of that. Solitude of you getting better. How did oh, you um, Just well, it, I basically had no choice. Um, <laughs> that was, that was really it. Uh, what I wanted to do was to spend as much time with my kids as I could. Um, I had two young kids. Um, I had set up uh, the, the house and the barn where the shop was, was about 100 yards apart. I built a whole play set and stuff like that in between so I could make knives and keep an eye on the kids and, you know, keep an eye on from the house. And that was my basis for trying so hard to actually do this for a living because I was sudden single father and I had two kids and, you know, I'm trying to spend time with them and, you know, feed and house them at the same time. Um, so basically any waking moment I had where I wasn't doing something to take care of them, I was working on knives and trying to build a business. I mean, I would do uh, when they weren't with me, I'd spend, you know, at least 12 hours a day in the shop. And then um, back in the day, you know, when the TV, you know, the computer monitors were, you know, huge, um, I'd spend three or four hours a night on, oh God, what was it? Knife forums, British Blade, uh, After Blade, something like that. There was like three or four uh, knife making forums that I'd go on and I'd post pics of what I was doing comment on other people's stuff, ask questions. If I dared to think I could answer a few questions, uh, but I figured the, you know, the more I was on there, the more people recognize my name and then maybe they'd pay attention to what I was doing. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's not an easy way to make a living. <laughs> yeah. I get kids all the time. It shows, yeah, I want to, I want to grow up and make knives like you. I'm like, no, don't go to, go to school, get an education, get a job, get some health insurance, then, then try messing around with knives. Okay. Please don't, I don't need that guilt on my conscience. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, you know, I come from a, a pretty artistic family and, um, uh, one thing that's very evident is that if you get an artistic training, get an art training or immerse yourself in that kind of pursuit, it also helps to get other kind of training, business training or law, mm -hmm. you know, I, preferably, I guess, um, just to learn how to market yourself. You know, it doesn't, uh, you know, toiling in obscurity is cool when someone else is like foot in the bill, but when you're out yep. on your own, uh, that's hard to do. So you were saying that a lot of this was pre-internet or, uh, you know, right mm -hmm. in the early stages. What, what was it like? <laughs> I mean, what was it like deciding that that you could actually make a go of being a knife maker before the internet? And I'll I'll just say the reason I'll say that is because right now it seems like uh, the world is wide open uh, with Instagram and YouTube and all that. Um, but what was it like then? 
Uh, I was probably making knives seriously for two to three years before I even knew there was a thing called a knife show. Um, and the only reason I even looked at that was because my father used to be a train enthusiast. I, I can't stand trains, but my father was into it. And I remember him going to train shows and dragging us to train shows. Uh, so, was, you know, there's, there's got to be something with knives they do something like that and i found this little show in lewisburg pennsylvania um and i i went to that and oh god it was terrible i mean i had deer skins over my i didn't have a tablecloth i threw deer skins and and most of the stuff i had was chopped out of you know ground out of files or saw blades and i mean god i still even had the teeth from the saw blade on the back it was, <laughs> it was, it was terrible it was horrible stuff um, and this guy, Keith Bagley from Maryland, he was a farrier. He, he was at the show. He was a very nice gentleman. He came over, um, took pity on my, took pity on me, basically invited me to his shop in Maryland for a weekend because that was right around when Damascus started becoming a thing again. Um, you know, Bill Moran kind of like rediscovered Damascus for America and, and, uh, that's what got me into forging because I started out as a stock mobile guy for the first few years. Um, but I was dumb and pigheaded and I didn't want to buy Damascus like everybody else was. I wanted to make my own. So Keith invited me down, taught me the basics of forging, forge welding. And uh, I blame him for everything. <laughs> and the rest is well, history. <laughs> the rest dumb, is dumbness, history. <laughs> dumbness and pigheadedness often uh, seem to pay off, it seems. So, it's working uh, so far, <laughs> <laughs> nicely done. So, so Shelly, you start. Um, you you meet Jay. Um, you become interested. Your um, love of ceramics uh, maybe postponed uh, slightly to 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 build your knife um, to build your knife making uh, shop. What right. are the kind of knives you're making? And you're in Texas, or you live in Texas uh, part time, or 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 you know, go back and forth. What are your uses for knives and what are the ones that you're really drawn to make? Um, I actually, it's kind of funny. Um, I am more of a handle material kind of person. So I look at handle material to get an inspiration for the blade that I'm going to make. I am still only making full tangs. Um, that's going to change this weekend. Um, I We're actually going to start my first um, hidden tang knife. Um, as far as the steels go, I was just doing, you know, mono steel blades at first, just getting good at grinding and stuff like that. Um, grinding is not fun, by the way. That's probably the worst part. Because right now I have a blister from Thanksgiving Day weekend that's just now coming off. <laughs> um, and uh, so to answer your question, I don't have a particular style. Um Jay probably has a hundred different patterns hanging up on his shop around the wall. He he cuts them out of what's that stuff? The plastic stuff that you cut your blank your oh, it's of. countertop material. It's Cor just Corian. Yeah. Oh, okay. So he has all of the different um, styles, and I look at some handle material. I get a um, you know an idea in my head of of a kind of a look or a style I want and I pick a pattern out and probably the at least the last five or six knives weren't even a copy from the pattern I would take you know this part of the blade and this different handle and put them together and you know make make my own hybrid yeah um that's that's Same. exactly where this one came from. Yeah, this one's awesome. Yeah, a lot of the, these patterns I've had for about a hundred years, and they just kind of hang on the wall. But yeah, she. So she this one, of hybrids out of them. this it's part of it, the the actual blade with the belly, it was a little bit shorter, and then this this handle. The lighting's not great in here. Oh, it's got that so little whale tail. whale tail kind of look to it, and the top profile. Um, this part uh, wasn't like that on the blank either 
on the pattern. So I just kind of did some elements together and put it together. <laughs> and this, here we are. This this blade looks like a landscape and there's a bird right up at the tip. Yeah. Uh, Where's that bird? That, yeah. That was that was an absolute fluke too. I love this is one of the things I love about Damascus. Hold, hold yeah. that a little bit closer to the to the camera for a second so we there's can see. No that. Way, there you there's go. There's no way you can redo that. That is crazy. That is so uh, what what this was was a nickel canoe canister that I was playing around when we did the canister uh, class at the Moran uh museum. Uh, William, Moran, what's it called? William Moran in, yeah, Foundation Moran Museum in Maryland. And um, I just laid some nickel out in a canoe uh, canister with some different, two different kinds of powder. And uh, that's what it, that's how it came out. <laughs> we, we've done a lot of, uh, that's actually one of the fun things. Cause I was, I was not doing a lot in the shop for a while. Uh, between the show and and just life in general and stuff like that, so when Shelly kind of started showing up and showing an interest and stuff, that kind of got me fired back up into it. And and we've done a lot of experimenting. I mean, God, yeah. one of the first one of the first things we did was that crazy meteorite canister. Yeah, we had nickel split. It was, we made a couple of blades out of it, but yeah, we we're just like we just we. I don't know. I don't know what other people do on dates, but we'd sit around and, <laughs> and you know, have some something that, you know, appetizers or a meal. And we'd be talking about, well, like, what if we put this in a can? What do you think this? Well, how do you think that would go? Well, what's well, what do you want to mix with it to give them contrast? Well, the hell, let's just try it this weekend and see what happens. And And that's kind of dating. <laughs> yeah, for us. Yeah, dating fun. amongst yes. knife makers yeah. well uh just in case um we don't talk too much about forging on this show just in case anyone who's listening might be wondering uh what's the difference uh, between a can and a canoe and actually just just break down a little bit what we're talking about uh you know high level uh simple way to go is if you've watched forge and forge and fire uh if we do a what we call as a canoe is square tubing with a cap on the bottom and you can fill it with whatever That's materials. You said canister. Canister. Oh, I'm sorry. A canister, <laughs> upright canister. You fill it, powder fills in all the voids and whatnot. Um, then you cap and forge it. And those you really don't concern yourself with patterning. Uh, the canoe is when you have that same square tubing lay it flat and cut one length of it off. And that way you can lay things out and you can actually lay a pattern out. Um, I've done bunches of mosaics that way um, and, you know, spacing them out and, you know, doing different patterns that way. So that's basically the difference. The upright, you don't have as much control. The canoe takes more welding, takes a little more effort, but you can actually control the patterning more. That's interesting. So it's a it's a more precise way to get uh, to get what you want, and mm -hmm. and there are other ways to add patterns uh, that that I mean we've seen on Forged in Fire. A noob like myself, I know you can make cuts and do like a ladder pattern, or you can mm -hmm. uh, drill and do that raindrop. That's so beautiful. Um, but uh, what when you first uh, you were saying that, uh, talking about Bill Moran and how he brought damascus steel back um in the states anyway uh once you learned that you said you were uh doing stock removal you saw that was it no turning back at that point everything you do pretty much is damascus am i right uh, yeah for the most part um it doesn't hurt the fact that i don't like shiny knives anyway i like <laughs> stuff that's dark that's forged that etched um and it, don't get me wrong forge finish uh, actually takes more work uh, than a flat ground finish, in my opinion. Uh, I tell people, I see people all the time, they're like, oh, yeah, I do forge finish too. And it's like, no, you just didn't clean that up. You what what does that mean? What is forge finish? Uh, forge finish to me is leaving the forge marks on, keeping them flat, keeping everything as flat as possible, and cleaning all of that scale out of there. I've seen too many people that call a, a forge finish knife that still has forged scale on it when it's finished laying on a table. That's that doesn't have a forged finish, is it? Hmm? Is that oh forged yeah. Finish? This yeah, well it's this is the battleship. It's a good example, actually. Um, this is my BB35 knife. 
let's see. If oh, God. oh that's, that. that's beautiful. So do you see like here, right yeah. here, that's forged. I didn't grind that. That's the forged finish, but it's all cleaned up. There's no scale in it. There's no junk in it. And when you're doing um, this type of thing with Damascus, um, you can normally see the pattern even in the forge finish. Um, this is actually sand my. This is cladded from the battleship, um, and it's kind of hard to see, but it's sand um, I wish with had Damascus right here. Tell us about this project, about the uh, battleship project. And before you put that away, uh, you got to okay. give us a full well, view. I, of I was going to pull back out. <laughs> oh, okay. I was, uh, was going to let Shelly, because she's the one that's been talking to everybody and, and she okay. she takes care of all this. I'm I'm the hermit up in the hills in Pennsylvania. She's the one that tells everybody. <laughs> so what, so what is this I was, battleship? I was getting um, submersed in the whole uh, social media that is, you know, follow, you know, stuff that was fo he follows and she she dove into the deep end of the pool. Yeah, like preserver. I did. I just dove right in. <clears throat> and somewhere, um, I'm really big on history, especially Texas history. I'm proud of where I'm from and all that. And in my scrolling, I saw something about a project where um the battleship Texas BB 35, it was being um, dry docked so that they could repair um, the outer hull. And there were, um, they were in the process of making um, a project, reaching out to artisans um, to make things to donate back to raise money. And I was like, oh my gosh, that would be so cool, you know, to have a piece of Texas history and make something from it. I was like, you need to, you need to reach out to these people. And someone had already she told me I was going to be involved in this. I had no choice in the matter. <laughs> someone had already reached out to him. I think it was Frank. Yeah. Yeah. Cause we we're like some guy named Frank something yeah. Frank is who you need to Sanders. talk to. Um, and we got in touch with them and what they do is, or what they did, they asked, um, metal workers of all kinds. You didn't have to be a knife maker, just and something, you know, mm -hmm. something that you do with steel. Mm -hmm. And they sent us, well, how, what is that? A, like a, oh, it was like a 10 by 10, plate. 10, 10 by 10 plate of the, of the, actual hull from the ship wow. and they said here make something with it and you the thing is you donate your item back to them and they're going to auction it off they're going to have a huge auction and uh we each got a piece um and it's very um cool well no the seal is like 1035 so it it's not something you can put you know, make the whole blade, you have to either sand my it or, you know, make it the cladding or something like you have to kind of work with it. And then they also um, later uh, acquired pieces of the deck wood. And um, so more artisans were able to come on making things out of wood. We also got um, a good chunk of the deck wood to make handle material out of. It's not really. Yeah, no, it was like, some kind of oak God, or pine weird. or something. It's it's very, very hard. <laughs> it's really hard uh, pressure treated wood, I'm sure. Um, and it's not very pretty mm. when you get it. But what he did is he actually um, dipped that in when he um, uh, etched, the blade. etched the blade. He put the mm. handle material in the etchant and then polished it up with, what did you put? Is Was that that? Australian stuff that you use? Or? Yeah, I, I etched it. Uh, I did a test piece, and in the ferric, uh, the deck would actually turn green, which wow. I, I thought was kind of cool. Um, yeah. But after I started, it didn't it didn't penetrate very deep into it, so I ended up hand rubbing it out and just using some uh, leather dye. Uh, but yeah, this is, and I'm strange like this i don't like doing what everybody else does i mean as soon as i mean i was making straight razors and as soon as people started doing that i get bored and same with <laughs> kitchen knives and all that i i'm just i yeah i don't know i just get bored easy that's why i have so many different types of knives on my website um but this i was trying to look for something because i figure you know battleship texas 
most folks are going to be going for buoys or K-bars or something like that. Um, I decided to look for something in the Pacific Theater. Um, and this is my take on, it was San Antonio. I can't remember the name of the company. Um, it was actually a, a hidden tang version. It actually, the blade was very similar. Had the fuller, had a double grind, had a tip on it. And it was a company in San Antonio. Uh, they just called them War Knives. They were taking broken sabers um, from previous battles and reconditioning them into fighting knives. Um, so they actually had this look and I just made a full tang version. So I just swelled this out kind of along the lines of what you're going to do with mm -hmm. the uh, NYC dagger. Um, took the battleship cladding, palm swelled it and etched it. And I just made a full tang version of it. Um, it is I, so... I really I'm pretty, I'm pretty uh, happy. But yeah, the whole cladding is uh, the battleship plate steel, and then there's a 52 layer uh, Damascus laminate in the core. But you know, that's just on the edges. I really wanted to highlight the battleship steel. Yeah, um, but yeah, it was fun. It's fun piece, and uh, uh, really want to uh, beat it against something, but. <laughs> Yeah, you can send it here. I'll beat it. I'll beat it against something. Uh, that is whoever, one. Whoever gets it at the uh, the battleship auction can beat the hell out of it, or I'll do it for them. Right. It's, you it's, never it's know. Really, really beautiful. To beat the hell out of. I, I gotta, I gotta ask you. Uh, you said it's double ground, as we could see. It's got the fuller in the center. Mm -hmm. uh, is is the top edge? Uh, is the top bevel also sharp? It is uh, about five thousandths. So okay. it's very close. I, I'm not putting an edge on it, right? Um, but it's it's pretty close. It's easily <laughs> sharpenable, but I figured I'd leave that one. It's uh, I, I really like the profile of that, especially like the 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 blade itself is uh, the profile is evocative of a K bar. Uh, but then when you look at the surface and the and the uh, and the bevels, it's not. And then as you move back on the handle, it's it's got a different handle that you can totally see the saber. Um, uh pedigree or whatever you legacy yeah. in it uh I, I think it's beautiful and yeah it's very different from um it looks different from anything else i was just looking at all your work you know and, and even uh, the conversion between hidden and full tang um that handle profile that i have on mine matches the handle profile that was on the hidden tangs um oh. I just didn't want to do a hidden tang <laughs> i got a teacher out of doing this weekend it's, yeah it's too much. So, Too much. so the, these these knives are going to go, and and, and Shelly, you're working on yours, which is a, a, a sort of a take on the on the New York City dagger, um, yeah. the famous pattern. Uh, I I love this idea. This is this uh, knife in the works, or do you have this something for us to look at? Um, well, it's that one is out in the shop, and it's okay. a full tang. I've got it profiled out, um, and I am going to do the rough grinds this weekend before. We temper it. Grind bevels, drill the holes, heat treat. Yep. <laughs> That's what's next. And it's so. going to be her first dagger grind, her first double grind. Yep. She's Ooh, learning nice. a so, lot of stuff very fast. Yeah. So everything is symmetrical, right? Every Well, I mm -hmm. guess I guess the, the profile is more of a clip point, but in cross-section, when you're looking at it straight on where it really counts, all of that has to be perfectly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nothing, nothing twisting to one side or the other or anything like that. No. It'll be interesting. <laughs> and it's my first one. So yeah. we'll see. You'll see if she so, curves as much as I do. <laughs> the long, the, the longer I'm, you know, so I've, I've been collecting knives basically my whole life. And I've, I've, the more I talk, the more and more and more I talk to people about it. And I love, that's why I have this whole podcast. So my family doesn't have to listen to this, uh, all the time, <laughs> but, um, the more I get into it, uh, geometry keeps coming up. Geometry, mm -hmm. geometry. And and I've really discovered this firsthand because I have a whole lot of knives. I am a collector. Uh, Jay, you were saying you are not. I have a whole lot of knives that don't get any use. They're here for my appreciation. It's like collecting art. Um, mm -hmm. But the one that I do use all the time is uh, we have two custom kitchen knives. And they are so thin already and then so thinly ground that even when they're dull, they cut like they're not. Tell mm -hmm. me a little bit about uh, the importance of geometry. And and is this just new to me or is this uh, a, like a newer 
part of the knife conversation these days? Oh, geez. Well, I mean, he's the wrong person to mm. ask this question. Oh, uh, no, I, I got I have, no. He eyeballs everything. I have, so. a, I have a very simple answer. <laughs> if you're concerned about edge geometry, it doesn't matter if it's a fighter, kitchen knife, hunter, belt knife, or whatever. Do not purchase a knife from somebody who does not use them on a regular basis. Um, edge geometry becomes a much bigger deal um, when people actually use the knives they make. Um, it, it, I, I'm not trying. I'm not trying to badmouth anybody, um, but you know that's the same as when you go to a knife show and you see, oh well, there's a nice, nice Bowie knife there. And you pick it up and you strain your wrist trying to get it off the table. And I can't imagine walking around the woods and PA deer hunting with something that's going to pull my pants down on the right hand side. I got to keep hiking them up. Um, weight and edge geometry are amazingly important. And I, I like to think even with the way the Forge of Fire show is with the time constraints and stuff, I think we've shown that. Uh, more and more, especially with the testing, even though the testing is pseudo for television and is extreme and stuff like that. A lot of that, um, especially with the cuts um, that Doug does a lot of times with the sharpness tests, you can see how much the edge geometry really makes a difference on things. And it's very easy. And I, I did this when I started, uh, when I first started doing stock removal before I knew what I was doing. I was making knives because I made this because I thought it looked cool. I didn't know what I was doing yet. Um, it's like when somebody first sent me a, a Scandi pattern to make. Uh, I made one and I had a secondary bevel on it because I didn't know any better. Somebody just sent me a picture. When I started using it, then I realized, okay, well, I'm making this wrong. I'm using it wrong. I'm making it wrong. What do I need to do to correct that? And that kind of attitude just bleeds through. It's just like, uh, it's the same as heat treating steel. Uh, I suggest somebody don't go whatever the new hot steel blade magazine said this month because three months are going to come up with another one and everybody dumps it and starts that. Pick a steel, learn how to heat treat it properly, correctly, then move on to the next one. Then learn that one and then do the same thing with your grinding um, like we, like Shelly's done. We started out very simple belt knife grinds, very simple stuff. Then we started adding... Um, top bevels. Now we're going to add double grinds. We've started adding fullers. Um, as you know, the same the same thing with geometry, handle design, all of this. You start. You got. You got to start with the basics and work up. But you got to use it. You've got to. I mean, I was one of those guys. People talk all the time about you know buckets full of blades and they're shot. Uh, I was wondering what I was doing wrong because I didn't have a bucket full of blades. I would take blades that I screwed up wrap them in duct tape or electrical tape, take them out in the woods, beat the crap out of them. Cause I figured if those knives held up, then the ones I didn't screw up would be even better. But it was a matter of just using it and seeing how it works, seeing how it cut, how can I make it better? And that's, I don't sleep well anyway. So I spend most of my <laughs> nights thinking about this kind of stuff. So he's his own, uh, quality control <laughs> yeah yeah I, yeah when i started making knives i had long luxurious brown hair <laughs> yeah now look at me so i got a forehead you, like you, a dolphin and silver hair you mentioned uh weight with geometry and we all know that the heavier a knife is the higher quality it is right mm. oh yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah that's a yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's like when you, that only works when you're picking up gold. You pick up bar of gold, the heavier it is, the better it is. It don't work with anything else. It it um, is a it is a funny instinct. Uh, people who who do not collect or like or use knives, uh, when they when they'll pick up something, um, the weight seems to matter. They're like, oh, it's nice and heavy. Yeah, um, well, I mean that that that's kind of a normal thing. You know, the bigger the knife, the better. I mean, good God, I, I even after going to Australia, I swear to God, one more person tells me that's not a knife. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's, it's it's the exact opposite, actually. Um, I mean, you can't see it like, you know, well, like this one right here. I'll, I'll pull this out again. Um, this entire handle between these two bolts is hollowed. 
it's mm. cut out. It's completely held out for light to, to lighten everything, to make things. I love having a 10, 12 inch Bowie knife or hunter or fighter on the table and somebody grabs it and goes, Oh, Oh, I didn't expect it, you know, to be that light. Well, yeah. I mean, who wants to, you know, be carrying a, a, a boring ax all the time or something like yeah. that. You, know, you, you want it. If, if it's not comfortable in your hand, which is another big thing on the show that I think we've shown people is it's not all about the blade. It's about the handle. If it's not comfortable to hold, if it's going to wear on your wrist, going to wear on your shoulders, uh, you're not going to use it. So what's the point of making it? So make it light, make it sharp, make it the edge geometry. I mean, all of these things tie together. It's not one or another. Um, it's like when I talk to Shelly about grinding uh, or anybody about grinding, it's not just making a straight pass. It's making sure you're flat, checking this angle, checking that. You've got to look at eight or nine different things while you're grinding a blade and listen at the same time because you might hear something that you don't see with your eye. Hmm. It, there's just uh, I'm babbling now. <laughs> no, well, it's just, no, it's too much to roll. explain. It's too much to explain. It really is. <laughs> you, and, I mean, um, us going to shows and you know, of course, me on social media looking at all these posts and stuff like that. I I started to whine a little bit because he makes me um, freehand grind everything. No jigs or anything like that. And, you know, Broadbeck's coming out with these cool platins, you know, that, that you can do all Not this stuff with. And, and, you know, I was fussing about it a little bit, but then the more, the better I get at it, I'm, I would rather learn the way he's teaching me because, it makes me understand it more. And if I mess up, I can fix it. I, you know, it's not, it's not something, I, I don't know what the word I'm looking for really, but uh, I, it's, it's like, I'm, I'm learning the steps instead of skipping over them and having to go backwards, I guess. I, I honestly have no problem with jigs and stuff. No, I but know. It, but, no, but <laughs> my point about this is um, if you want to use them, great. That's, that's cool. But I think it limits you. If you're using a jig to make sure your grinds are even, then you're going to be using that jig to make sure your grinds are even. Take it off. Yeah. 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 That, that, that's, mean, kind of the that's, same that's, point. A, that's the thing. If you don't have that jig, you can, you can do things. You've seen how many different ways you can tweak a blade. Yeah. You can't do that all the time when something's yeah. clamped to it. It's, it seems like jigs are especially useful if you're a, a, a one person shop and you're trying to um, maybe, reach another level, sell as many knives in mm -hmm. one pattern yeah. as possible. Um, so you can kind of zip through them and know that you're, you've got some repeatability, uh, but you, it is interesting point. You're, you're, you're talking about uh, not skipping um, steps and really taking your time and going from, you know, being sure you're, you're nailing everything. Well, when you look at the, at the show forged in fire, these contestants are under the gun. They're, they're timed. Um, it's funny because my wife and I are total uh, uh, armchair knife makers. We're like, they didn't ask you to take off the canister. Why are you? <laughs> Thank, you. With Thank you very much for that. I appreciate or, that. Or like, have they never seen this? You don't you don't put it in water like, you know, I, I, even I know that. That's my wife. Uh, this is so, the first time I've ever made a canister. Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. You didn't you didn't practice thinking that might come up. Um, but so what what do those how is that different? I mean, I know Jay, you've done some of the competition uh, on the show when they've when you know uh, when they had the competition with the hosts. But what is that like, and how is that different from say how you do it on the daily? It's horrible. It's terrible. I hated it. I hate it. I, they made me do it. I didn't want to do it. Um, no, I told him. I said, "You guys told me I could be a judge. What do you mean I got to get on the floor now?" Uh, no, it, it was one of those things like, okay, yeah, it's good because it looks like fun and you spend, I mean, I don't know about the other guys. I mean, they, they pretty much feel the same way, um, but you you watch the what's going on, on the floor and you're a claw on the tabletop. You want to crawl over that table and run out there and start working with them and, and say, oh, like, let's try this. No, no, don't do it. You know, but you can't. It, that's the worst part for me is just trying to keep my ass in the chair. Um but yeah, it, it's totally different. I mean, I don't work that e even even when I was busting my butt 
you know, starting out, I mean, I, I worked hard, but having that clock on you and having the limitations, uh, you really got to think on your feet. And uh, I know me and I, I talked to Dave too when, when he did it and we were like, oh yeah, we've seen this a hundred times. We've been making knives forever. This is going to be a breeze. Huh. Nope. <laughs> it was wow. terrible. Uh, it's just, you really have to um, really take a breath and time management is the biggest thing. Try to figure out, okay, I'm going to give myself this much time to do this and this much time to do that. And it still doesn't matter as much as you try to plan it out in your head, it all goes south. So you end up scrambling at the end. It's um, a lot of pressure. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's one more coming up where, where I was, I competed again. And, oh, at the la at the end, it's like, okay, bang, bang. Okay. That's close enough. I'm done. Come on. Get, <laughs> get me out of here. I've had it. Can't take it anymore. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting and I don't make swords. I mean, I've made, oh God, I don't know, probably about 20 years ago. I think I made two. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, and they, they've been nice and tried to take that into consideration, you know, making big knives instead of swords. And this time I told Mr. Luck, you know, 90% of the people come out here don't know how to make swords anyway, or never have. And I don't either. So have with it. So makes it a little more fair yeah yeah, yeah. Even the I, already, I, already, I bert foster already beat my butt so yeah. <laughs> i've already gotten killed so that's okay well Sh yeah. shelly where where do you want to take uh gypsy soul uh what like what are the you know where do you want to take you're kind of at the beginning of of this uh uh road where do you want it to take you in terms of knife making what kind of stuff do you want to do just learning the craft um, and being able to express myself artistically kind of, it kind of fills that void. Um, I don't. Um, go on, say it. I know you're going to say it. Go on. <laughs> what? I'm not going to go on Fortune Fire. No, <laughs> no, I don't plan on going to the show. And at this point I, I am a part of the ABS. I am an apprentice. Um, and, Texas. and Texas Knife Makers Guild. I'm a, a member of there as well. I've, I've already uh, tested for my Lone Star Maker and got my Lone Star Maker. Um, and I don't know if I'm going to test for my JS. That's still kind of up in the air, you know, to get my journeyman. And um, you can stop making the masks for a little while. Yeah. And, you know, the idea of, being a master bladesmith is pretty cool, but it's not, it's not a pressure kind of thing. Um, the main reason I like making knives now, it's something that we can do together, him and I. Um, and that's really what it is now, right now. Um, it is, it is very cool and exhilarating to go to a show and sell out all my knives. That's always pretty cool. I've done that. I've done that twice. This is the only one I have left that I've got made right now is that one. Um, it just hadn't found its person yet, but it really is just a creative outlet right now. And, um, just a learning experience. And like I said, we, we get to travel. I mean, we were yeah. able to, uh, go to Australia, uh, this summer and, uh, attend the Sydney show, Gamaco, mm -hmm. hang out with those guys out there. And, uh, we got to teach classes at Everly works for a week. We did a couple classes teaching mm -hmm. canisters. Uh, we've been teaching canisters all year. We've been doing that. Shelly can peel a canister faster <laughs> than I can anymore. I got, I got to keep buckling it till it falls out now. Cause she, <laughs> I can't even compete with her. She's been peeling canisters all over the country for the last year. Yeah. Uh, that's cool. Shelly, uh, it, not as many women knife makers. We don't see as many on the show. I, we just watched one last night with a, with a, a woman knife maker, one of the, uh, forge and fire shows, but just in general, um, have you found, uh, a warm embrace from the knife community? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, the knife making community in general is very friendly, helpful, um, anything you need. Um, 
there. Um, and then of course you had the Texas hospitality with that, you know, of being in Texas, the first couple of shows we went to were in Texas and, um, it was just amazing. Um, the next show that we have booked is the Texas Select in Belleville mm -hmm. with Elena and Cowboy Samansky. That's a great show. Um, they just made us feel so incredibly welcome. That's a really great show to go to. And um, so, yeah, as far as that goes, everybody's been very helpful and very nice. Any questions I have. And um, I like... I like going and asking questions and stuff. At first I was kind of shy, but now, um, uh, not shy no, <laughs> I'll walk up to somebody's table. Like, how did you do that? <laughs> you know, and start asking questions and stuff. And just about everyone is very, uh, helpful and is excited to explain, you know, their technique or whatever and talk about their, um, knives. That's that's good to hear because you oftentimes uh, hear about uh, women in male-dominated industries who have it difficult. Uh, uh, I I kind of had a feeling when I was asking you uh, what your answer would be because like there's no place I feel more comfortable than a giant room full of knife makers and and you know <laughs> like-minded knife nerds. Uh, like I could I could stand there without eating for hours j jabbering and looking at looking at knives. Uh, Jay. Uh, let me ask you this in the period of time, 10 seasons, congratulations of forged in fire. That's pretty big accomplishment. But yeah, in those 10 no years, how has your knife making been affected in terms of, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe it's in terms of seeing so many competitors, uh, try different approaches, or maybe it's rubbing elbows with, uh, you know, other, other, uh, judges who are accomplished knife makers and explaining, you know, when you're teaching and explaining, you learn things, how has this experience affected your knife making? Uh, honestly, it actually inhibited my knife making for quite a while. Um, because when I started Forge and Fire, um, I already had a two to three year backlog on orders and it just got bigger. Um, so my biggest problem was we'd shoot the show, especially when COVID came. That, that was because, I mean, I'd, I'd go um, on the set on days we weren't shooting and actually use the shop and, and make knives. Once COVID came, we couldn't even do that. Um, so I would go, you know, the whole time we were shooting a season and not even touch a tool um, and then come home and then be scrambling to try to make knives to fill these orders that are so far back. And then I was making knives that I had made five years ago and didn't have any interest in making those. And then I'd be on the show. And then, I mean, I just turned 54 this month. I'd have kids that were less than half my age showing up on the show and they were doing stuff that I hadn't even tried yet. And I was like, okay, I, I can't do this anymore. So I, I finally broke down and I, I canceled all the orders. I, anybody who gave me a deposit, I refunded the deposits. Oh, wow. I gave them at least six other people that I personally own knives from and have worked with um, that I would have no problem, you know, having somebody else get work from. And I really just needed to, just get away from that and just kind of go back to what Shelly's doing. Maybe not starting out, but just making what he, I wanted to. Yeah. He can go in the shop now and, and just whatever he feels like making, um, he just goes out there and does it and he enjoys it so much more. I mean, I, I could see the difference. And I'm producing a lot. More. Yeah. Yeah. And um, he, he sees something he's like hey i want to try that and the next day he's out there and he's trying it and there are a lot of things like he made his first uh stainless steel san mai what right after, that? after yeah. yeah like a year within the last year yeah so you know he's been making knives for 25 years and he just now got the chance to play around play around with stainless San Mai mm -hmm. and it's stuff like that. He just hadn't had a chance to do and he gets to do that now. 
that that concept of having to work on the stuff you were working on five years ago i'm so done with this mm -hmm. yeah uh, and yeah. and and at the same time seeing um you know the the hungry young um rogue males coming up doing all this crazy stuff you haven't done i, yeah. I could imagine you know creatively uh how that must have stung a little bit and yeah and creatively i was like hey, why am i doing this <laughs> i'm not enjoying it why am i doing it yeah. So I decided I need to start enjoying it again. And he does. He finally has. So. And I well, honestly think I'm making better stuff than I ever have. Yeah. Jay, what, what, uh, as we close here, tell me what your ultimate knife or your ultimate forge build is that you haven't made yet that, that you, uh, Ooh, that yeah. you want to take on at some point. I don't know. That's <laughs> that depends on the day of the week. <laughs> uh, I know you don't one, have a nemesis. <laughs> well, my nemesis is you and the feather pattern you <laughs> want to do. That's that's my next challenge. This yeah. one here, she doesn't want to do anything easy. She she just you know she started making we started off with canisters and then she started like layering canoe. nickel and meteorite and all yeah. that. She doesn't start anything easy, so. <laughs> You know, it's a good thing I got some experience under my belt because this one wants to try everything crazy. You know, she never says, hey, let's just make a 1095 kitchen knife. No, yeah. no, no. Even the first couple of knives, she made her full tangs. Well, can we put a spacer in the middle of the scale? Yeah, my Excuse second me? knife was a segmented scale knife. Yeah, it's like, yeah, let's make 11-piece full tang scales. Yeah, sure. This is your third knife. No problem. <laughs> Hey, so yeah, know, she keeps me on my toes. But yeah, the next thing, well, my thing is I before about a year, about two years ago, um, when I was really hard at it, um, I was mostly a hidden tang knife maker. I didn't make very many full tang knives at all. Um, maybe twenty percent of what I made was full tang. Everything else was hidden tang with a guard or, or you know, fully threaded pommels and whatnot. Um, and I really, you know, got really motivated and back into things when Shelly started showing up in the shop and normally you, know, you start off with full tang knives with somebody. Um, so that's what we've been doing. And I, I've had a lot of fun playing with different, um, ways of etching full yeah. tang knives yeah. because I am a raging jackass when it comes to somebody having a full tang knife that's etched with a shiny tang uh, that just drives me out of my <laughs> mind because there's a lot of good pattern in those tangs. I don't care if it's a sand mine or not. Why would you not etch the whole thing? Yeah. Um, so I've come up with three or four different ways of doing it. Um, my favorite at the moment is still just coating everything with clear nail polish and etching it after you finish it. But anyway, that's a whole, you know, that's going to be another demo I'm sure we'll end up doing. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was fun exploring new ways to approach you know, something that I've done a million times. Um, but now we could start doing the hidden tangs, which is what I really enjoyed, adding guards. Um, I was doing that before I started forging when I was doing stock removal. I, I beat myself up about fit and finish um long before i ever started forging so i actually and i was doing hidden tangs so guard fit ups and stuff like that um i think i pretty well had under my belt before i even started forging so adding that element to a damascus blade or you know damascus guard or wrought iron or etching that and then just making that and the, the hidden tang gives you so much more freedom in the handle material too because you're not stuck with just the sides you've got you know 360 degrees pommel i mean it's a whole nother whole nother canvas to begin with so i'm i'm looking forward to starting doing that again because i got a feeling once i start doing the hidden things again i'm gonna go right back to doing that all the time <laughs> right well we can't wait to see that and before i let you go i know i said that was my last question but i i want to since you're bringing up the different tang types uh show if you will the integral uh keyhole that you were showing oh, yeah. right yeah, before we started rolling there's only there's only two knives that i've made that i've kept um one was the um the chopper i made on the home forge episode 
that we did a forge and fire. Um, and then this one, this was my first uh, keyhole knife where it's all Damascus, top, bottom, it's all one piece, and then African blackwood key slotted in there. And I, I haven't sold this one because I worked so hard on it. I really like it. I, <laughs> I haven't decided to get rid of it yet. So that yeah. is I'm sure I'll sell it eventually because I don't keep anything. But that, It's an absolute beauty, and whoever ends up with it uh, will be no doubt totally totally psyched uh jay and shelly it's been a real pleasure talking with both of you thank you so much for coming on the knife junkie podcast uh we're going to talk a few more minutes for for patreon members uh mm -hmm. get a couple of extra minutes uh but right. thank you both so much it's been a pleasure sounds thank good you. appreciate the invite There they go, ladies and gentlemen, Jay Nielsen and Shelly Jack. Uh, it was really cool. We didn't talk about this, but it was really cool at the Texas Custom Knife Show, walk, uh, watching them work together on a canister, uh, Damascus. And uh, there was a, a whole crowd that was wrapped in the action. It was very cool to watch. And uh, yeah, it just uh, it just solidified that someday, one of these days, I'm going to bother my neighbors uh, with a forge and an anvil. All right. Uh, be sure to join us again next week on uh, the Knife Junkie podcast for another great conversation. Also, Wednesday for the midweek supplemental and Thursday for Thursday Night Knives. Uh, we are going to be giving away something pretty special uh, from Northern Knives coming up here real soon. So be sure to keep your eyes open. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time. Don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.